The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome, everybody, uh, watching out on YouTube and listening in on our Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination podcast called Into the Impossible. And today, it's quite a treat to be joined by uh, three distinguished intellects. On my right is Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here and honored to be <laughs> included in this group of <laughs> truly great intellects. I'm not sure I qualify, but... It's like a crossover episode on, like, you know, cartoons <laughs> yes, of, of, of years past. Uh, and to in front of me is Dr. James Benford, who is a proud uh, hometown hero, a, a alum of UC San Diego, graduate in the class of 1969 in the PhD program. Thank you, James, for being here. Glad to be here. Always good to come back to paradise. Yes, <laughs> it is quite lovely. And I should say, James is the uh, president founder of Microwave Sciences in Lafayette, California. And to his right is Professor Paul Davies, a man who needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. He's the uh, founder director of the Beyond. Center at Arizona State University, which uh, in part is sort of an inspiration for what we wanted the Clark Center to be, a home for intellects and, and excursions and in the intellectual peripatetic landscape that we like to traverse. And I want to thank you so much for being here and joining us last night in conversation about ET. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the uh, amongst the four of us. And Paul, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, the Beyond Center, we call it the Center for Cool Stuff. And we specialize in the impossible. Yes, uh, that's right. So as Arthur C. Clarke, our namesake said, the only way to find out what is possible is to go into the impossible a little bit, or in some cases a lot. And last night we talked about the possibility or perhaps lack thereof here on campus in conversation between the two of you uh, about whether or not ET is, is perhaps already here. Not that uh, ET will be detected, but perhaps there are ways to detect that ET is actually already among us in, in one way or another. And I I wondered if we could sort of discuss, you both have novel ideas as to how life could arise here on our interplanetary surface uh, that we call home, or perhaps near to us, and yet have evaded detection. But you both point to ways that humankind could make first contact, could discover the uh, uh, origin of another type of life form, and you both have novel ways that you've decided to approach this problem. I think maybe I'll start with, with Jim. Jim, what are some of the um, l more likely scenarios in your mind that might pan out successfully to discover the presence, perhaps in the past, of an extraterrestrial civilization? Uh, I've proposed recently that uh, we might look uh, near Earth at the moon or the newly discovered group of co-orbital objects to see whether or not uh, extraterrestrial intelligence had in the past, including the distant past, located a probe to observe Earth and the residual uh, probes now inactive might be found, or even active probes today, uh, in a sense then we would be looking at interstellar archaeology, yeah. uh, artifacts from the distant past observing the ecosphere of Earth. Hmm. Would this not be similar to another creation of our namesake or related to it in 2001? The monolith that the uh, that mm -hmm. is discovered on the moon and the concomitant uh, discovery of uh, of gravity by uh, by primates on Earth um, is that not what Sir Arthur C. Clarke was perhaps expressing in that same uh, in that same uh, uh, Yes, and in the predecessor uh, short story called The Sentinel, in mm -hmm. which the monolith was not buried, it need not be because you couldn't have seen it from with telescopes from Earth. You have to go there, uh, but burying it made it detectable only by magnetic field, and therefore you have to be very sophisticated ah, and have orbiters in order to find it. Uh, it's very much like that. I'm talking about extraterrestrial artifacts. Yes. Interesting. So, Paul, here, as you know, we have the world-famous San Diego Zoo. And um, whenever I take my kids, and, and uh, they're, they're reasonably well-behaved, at least uh, half of them are, and uh, as we go there, we are always careful to observe the, the regulation that you may not pound on the, on the ca cages of the apes or the primates or whatever, that you have to keep a, keep a low profile. And, and might it be possible for aliens to escape our knowledge uh, if they treat us sort of like those same zoo creatures where they just don't interact with us, but they're here in some other form? Is that... Is that not a reason that they could be lurking amongst us almost? One of the difficulties about guessing 
the motives of an extraterrestrial civilization is that they could be stupendously far in advance of our own. And indeed, there's no particular reason why they will be flesh and blood uh, beings. Mm. Uh, they, this may, it may well be here on Earth that we hand over the heavy lifting, intellectual heavy lifting, to design systems. People use words like computers and robots, but they fail to capture what in a hundred years or a thousand years is, is going to take place here on Earth. That, mm. that these will be design systems uh, and the motives of uh, the nth generation of design systems are utterly uh, beyond us. And so if we imagine some other civilization out in the galaxy uh, perhaps taking an interest in the solar system, an interest in humanity, uh, what what will they be trying to achieve? Mm. Uh, will they want to uh, make themselves known to us or observe us without being known? Or will they ignore us completely? We, we don't, we have no idea. Mm. So my attitude uh, to searching for signs that we're not alone is to search wherever we can using whatever technology we can particularly if it's cheap and so at the moment SETI has been dominated by the idea that ET will be beaming messages at earth and we should sweep the skies with radio telescopes hoping to stumble across that message uh, directed to humanity. Mm. I don't think that's terribly credible. Uh, I think we need to simply search every database because alien technology may manifest itself in a way that uh, we would not even think of. Mm. Um, and by searching every available database, I mean, I'll give you a, a, a quirky example. Um, one of the things that's being done at the moment, it's free on the internet, is sequencing genomes like crazy. So uh, in the cancer research community or the biological community generally, this is the technology of choice these days. Mm -hmm. you, you find some sort of weird microbe, you sequence it. And all of this stuff is out there. So why don't we just search uh, the genomes of all of these organisms, uh, viruses, bacteria, anything else you can mm. get your hands on. It's all there. You mm. can write algorithms that can search through to see if there's a message from ET yeah. uh, concealed in them. Mm. But why might that happen? How might that happen? Well, we can edit and engineer genomes with our own technology to put messages uh, in genomes. Craig Venter did just that. He put his email address and some, some poetry of Feynman uh, into the genome of a, a, an engineered organism. So uh, you can upload information into bacteria with a, a viruses, retroviruses. Uh, is it conceivable that some um, uh, advanced civilization has done this, maybe in the deep past, and that this message is somehow preserved. We don't know how. It would remain stable over a long period of time. But if they've solved that problem, uh, the, the truth might be inside us. <laughs> <laughs> the truth might be in here, right. So you're, you're widely credited with uh, popularizing an idea that perhaps uh, because of the exchange between the planets, in particular between Mars and the Earth over a re relatively short period of geological history, maybe tens of millions of years, perhaps microbial life could be exchanged. And I think you've said in the past, we might find life on Mars, but it may have come from Earth, or conversely, life could come from Mars to the Earth. And, and to my right is, of course, Matt Kaplan, who's a member of an organization who spent a lot of time uh, thinking about Mars. And, and it's pretty interesting because you think back to Percival Lovell in the early part of the 1900s, uh, thinking that he saw canals on Mars. And uh, and yet the popularity amongst the public of exploring Mars, for example, um, uh, still is so enduring. And can you speak about why is Mars so important, at least among in, in the popular uh, cog cognizance of a place to look for life, or is it that you know we're looking for water, and and that might be a harbinger of potential life on Mars? What is it about Mars that's so captivating? Why do we keep sending so many very sophisticated uh, missions to go to Mars? And I, people, I think it's largely well. I mean, the interest goes back to ancient times, but I think Percival Lowell had a lot to do with this because he really was part of that move at the turn of the 20th century and a little before, getting people to think Mars may be very much like where we live. And wouldn't it be reasonable, therefore? And of course, when he thought he saw those canali and that the Martians were smart enough to bring water from the poles to the equator where it was warmer, um, you know, that's when you first started talking about Medi, right? Mm -hmm. The messages. Uh, we were going to build gigantic semaphores and tell the Martians, hey, we're over here, mm -hmm. your neighbors. Um, I think that stuck with us. I mean, just look at science fiction. 
and a lot of bad science fiction movies <laughs> set on Mars um, that uh, push this. Um, and of course, you know, NASA's gone from fall of the water because we followed it, we found it, we know it's there, quite a bit of it, to let's now really start the serious look for life. Mm -hmm. I can't, I, I'm, as my boss would say, uh, Bill Nye, the Bill science Nye. guy, our CEO, mm -hmm. that if we found life on Mars, it would change everything. Mm -hmm. Even if we discovered, as Paul said, that that life maybe were cousins. Uh, right. Uh, the, for me, the fundamental question is, uh, is life as we know it just a freak accident that occurred some in some little corner of the universe, and we are it, and maybe it's spread around a bit, maybe to Mars, maybe slightly beyond, or is the transition from non-life to life built into the fundamental nature of the universe? Do we live in an intrinsically bio-friendly universe in which there's some sort of life principle or progressive tendency right at the level of the laws of physics and chemistry. Now, if there is such a life principle, we haven't found it yet. And if you talk to physicists and chemists about this uh, teleology is the technical term, that there's a sort of goal-oriented march of progress uh, built into nature, um, it's anathema to, mm -hmm. to them. And yet, the same people will say, oh, the universe is teeming with life on the assumption that this transition from non-life to life uh, is a very natural thing. I might say that this has occurred just during my career. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, I was really gung-ho for SETI and looking for aliens and so on. And uh, I might as well have professed an interest in looking for fairies. <laughs> Everybody thought it was absurd, that life was a bizarre freak. It was limited to Earth, complete waste of time and money to look for any life beyond Earth. And now everyone says, oh, yes, the universe is teeming with life. Mm -hmm. And yet the fundamental science really hasn't changed very much in my career. Statement of faith. We still don't know no, how non-life right. turns into life, Nothing whether makes it's likely more or very unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of uh, messaging into space, you know, what are the... One of the chief concerns about messaging to space, uh, as expressed by Stephen Hawking, who, who, as Paul has pointed out in the past, came up with sort of a version of the Fermi paradox, from famous case of if life is teeming and abundant throughout the universe, how come, where are they? You know, that's his question. And Hawking had sort of a corollary. Uh, not just in space, but in time, you know, where are all the time travelers? You know, there should be abundant ability for time travelers of the distant future to transition and make these quantum leaps backwards in time. And yet we have to date, although there are some people I think are quite spacey and quite uh, out of time that I know personally on the faculty. No, they're not. They're not my colleagues here. But, um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, Stephen Hawking also warned against the uh, broadcast of our presence here, uh, perhaps by high powered microwave systems, such as the kind that you've pioneered and written about in your books, but do you have concerns about this messaging, medi, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence in that it might be, you know, an eat here kind of sign for the planet? Well, I'm uh, a moderate in these matters, uh, middle of the road, meaning I think we ought to have a deep conversation about it through international means. Uh, but that ha that opinion, uh, which I've held for a long time, has not ca caught a lot of interest. Uh, we're not talking about it widely. But I think if, if, if since it is now possible for a billionaire to build a beacon that's visible across hundreds of light years, uh, we ought to be thinking about whether or not we want to allow that to happen or and, and ask him what kind of message he's going to send mm -hmm. and whether we, in fact, want to be heard at all. Mm -hmm. That's a, a conversation we need to have. And I would encourage uh, your universities to advocate such. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like we're on the verge of becoming, you know, at least, a, a, you know, junior freshman level interplanetary species? We will actually send, thanks to these benevolent billionaires, I don't know if that, if they are or not, but but uh, with this capability, as Jim just said, to broadcast, but also to fund space missions. And as Elon Musk said, he wants to die on Mars. And as Lord Martin Rees told me when he was here, he's worried Martin, uh, that Elon will die on impact on Mars. But, but besides that, are we on the verge of becoming an interplanetary species ourselves and, and perhaps using ourselves as a messenger to outer space? Well, if you count our robotic emissaries mm -hmm. as being among us, mm -hmm. uh, as truly representing us, we have been an interplanetary, interplanetary species for decades. Yeah. Um, we certainly are becoming more so. You know, our, as we speak, uh, Congress is uh, putting its, um, uh, I won't say best foot forward, but a foot forward into whether 
and how we're going to get to Mars and put humans there, and whether that should come before or complement what we're doing at the moon. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the current administration and therefore NASA have a somewhat different view uh, that this part of this Artemis program. One way or another, and I'm only talking about the U.S. of course, I think we will actually be a flesh and blood multiplanetary species mm -hmm. at some point, if only Mars, mm -hmm. maybe Mars and the moon. Um, because really, where else would you want to live except maybe on some huge O'Neill space station? Right. And that's uh, that's questionable too. But but I think we're headed in that direction, mm -hmm. especially if somebody comes up with a way to make money out there. Right. And they're still working on that. Right. And so, Paul, you gave some arguments as to why a extraterrestrial civilization of an intelligent beings might not want to send themselves or their emissaries here. Uh, for one thing, you know, the energy requirements needed to uh, get uh, a massive object here of a reasonable amount of mass and then to decelerate that object so that it can have a nice soft landing and become a lurking beacon on, on an inter-solar uh, um, inter uh, system object, as, as James has, has professed. What are some of the arguments against as you presented and, and as you present in the Eerie Silence, the book on which, in part, our conversation was based last night. What are some reasons to be pessimistic about the existence of life uh, elsewhere, and especially technological life, not, not just intelligent life? Well, I already mentioned uh, the big error bars that yes. surround the probability that non-life will turn into life, given mm -hmm. a habitable planet. So there's plenty of real estate on mm. which life could pop up. But what is that pop-up factor? Uh, that uh, we don't know. But even if it gets going, uh, we still, of course, don't know uh, how likely it is that uh, simple microbial life will eventually turn into complex, intelligent life. However, we do know the process. It's called Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. We don't know the process that turned non-life into life. So right. uh, that's still the, the big one for yeah, me. Yeah, didn't Darwin um, say something that would be as uh, foolish to look for the origin of life as for the origin of matter? <laughs> he did, and it's interesting that we physicists have now no, explained the origin right. of matter, exactly. but, but we, we're still stumped with the origin of life. But even supposing it gets going and you get some advanced civilization, then the question is, uh, how do they best explore their environment. And mm. the idea of traveling, uh, you know, flesh and blood beings in uh, big metal uh, objects uh, hurtling through interstellar space, uh, we've been misled by too much uh, science fiction, I'm, I'm afraid. And this just makes no real sense, mm. because why would you travel? You travel only for exploration or colonization. Now, if you want to colonize, that's a different matter. Um, if you want to explore, you, you would send robotic probes as light, as micro-miniaturized as possible, at the highest uh, speeds possible, it's still a very slow process. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we were to send out probes even to the nearest star uh, at 20% of the speed of light, you're still waiting like 20 years mm -hmm. uh, to get that information back. And so it's, it's really uh, a very long-term project that uh, mm -hmm. might uh, under, undermine the, the motivation of uh, e even the most curious society. Mm -hmm. But travel for colonization is a possibility, mm -hmm. but there are formidable obstacles. So let's just imagine we might do it. Yeah. You know, wouldn't it be great to send... Uh, Say a thousand my people. Dean, my dean uh, to one another. Uh, right, right. We can all think, uh, we all have our favorite <laughs> lists of who should go. Uh, but if we're talking interstellar now, uh, then uh, probably uh, we would never achieve uh, without some sort of science fiction technology like warp drives and so on. But with any physics we know, would never achieve anything that would get you there in less than th several thousand years. Uh, and that's okay if you can uh, hibernate the crew. Mm. But the one thing that really bothers me, and this has only emerged in the last 10 years or so, is it's not enough to uh, send human beings and sort of basic uh, foodstuffs, uh, potatoes, for example, uh, uh, y you have to send the entire microbiology. So we've got mm. more cells in our bodies that are bacteria and archaea than our own cells. So this is yeah. part of the, uh, uh, the, the so-called microbiome. This is the life support system mm -hmm. of human beings. And every other organism has similar 
uh, microbiomes. And mm -hmm. if you ask the question, well, what is the smallest subset of terrestrial ecology mm -hmm. that you can isolate and be self-sustaining? We don't even know how to go about answering mm -hmm. that. It's no good getting halfway there and find some vital microbes being left behind. Mm -hmm. So we don't understand enough about the web of life at that mm -hmm. micro level uh, to know just what it would take. So, so when you get to the other end, you might find a wonderful planet which is uh, habitable, but you're lacking some really critical stuff right. to have a self-sustaining ecosystem yeah, at the other end. An another one of your brilliant graduates, Kim Stanley Robinson, yeah. in his book Aurora, which upset a lot of people, he explored exactly, Paul, what you're talking about and the difficulties of getting a colony ship to any place, dealing with the microbiome, and even just dealing with elements that... Uh, would be dissipated. You wouldn't be able to, you'd have to bring enough, I'm trying to think of what some of them were, some of the compounds that you would need. Mm. Um, uh, it, it disappointed a lot of us who would, you know, have always believed that humans would spread across the galaxy. Uh, but it, it it's a very thoughtful book. Yeah. Well, let, let me say I thought the Aurora plot line, and, and in fact, the, the basis of it was actually wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 well, he, t he wanted that answer, and so he got <laughs> you know, you can write a story with any ending you want. Uh, but there were, uh, in fact, there, uh, my brother and I wrote an extensive critique of that that appeared. You saw in, that, uh, yes. The, uh, Your New brother, York, Greg New York, Benford, we should mention. Uh, uh, yes, a uh, uh, New York Review of uh, Science Fiction uh, published that. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it said, basically, there were a lot of uh, choices he deliberately made that made it difficult, uh, uh, not because he, he didn't discover it being difficult. He wanted it to be impossible. He's an opponent of interstellar flight. And I wanted to mention that what Paul is saying, uh, he uh, wrote about extensively in a very nice piece. And if people want to know more about it, it appears in a book that I edited called Starship Century. And he has an extensive discussion of those issues about how do you export an, a biosphere. Mm. So I want to read from the Eerie Silence, speaking of your brother. <clears throat> this is Paul's book from 2010. So it's the 10th anniversary of this book, which itself was written on the 50th anniversary of Frank Drake and the Osmo Project, the first real search for extraterrestrial intelligence in West Virginia with an enormous radio telescope, as I said, built in the 60s. And as you say, you know, it's, it's depressing on one hand how little we've made, despite the truly beyond Moore's law increase in capability. You saw some of the experimental capability we have today just in UC San Diego and throughout the whole world. Radio astronomy has become phenomenally sensitive, and yet we haven't seen it. And so the probability, you say here, Paul, the possibility that alien civilizations might, <clears throat> might look – long ago have created powerful radio beacons and that humans have the means to detect them has been studied in detail by Greg and Jim Benford, twin physicists working in California. Greg is an astrophysicist and also an award-winning science fiction writer, while Jim is an expert on high-intensity microwave beam technology. The way that Benford see it, ancient civilizations could have many reasons to build a beacon. For example, it could be a high-tech moment, monument, to uh, uh, of pride to what may be a glorious but now van long vanished civilization. The funeral pyre. Yes, a beacon is also a great way to attract attention and seek and simply make first contact. Anyone detecting it would redouble their efforts at SETI. And lastly, it could conceivably be an artistic, cultural, or religious symbol, or even the cosmic equivalent of graffiti. It might be a cry for help, or as with the humble lighthouse, a warning. Do you still stand by these words that were quoted by Paul in, in this book 10 years after its publication? Uh, yes, there are many possible motivations. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would, uh, I, one you left out is that it might be a religious message mm. uh, uh, because uh, a lot of human history is like the history of mm -hmm. Islam is mm -hmm. let's spread our religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what a lot of people use the airwaves for already. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the fact that we haven't found any beacons is starting to make that look less and less probable and therefore we are approaching a time when we can say that that's a proposition which has been falsified. Oh, but we haven't looked that uh, much because as you pointed out you need mm -hmm. to stare at a fixed patch of sky for a long duration because this thing is going to sweep the plane of the galaxy and uh, that signal will repeat and uh, I don't think anybody has really put in a big systematic effort. To, well, to, to recall, though, that the Breakthrough Listen program is spending $10 million a year doing exactly that, and they're going to do it for a decade. At the end of that, we, I sh I'm sure that Yuri Milner, who funded it, would like to have at least a partial answer. Uh, yes, but we're not there yet, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, we're six years into it. 
Yeah, um, of course, and that's frequently said, and you brought this up last night, uh, that, you know, uh, lack of evidence is not evidence of absence, or absence of evidence not evidence mm-hmm. of absence. Um, and yet, it is a, you know, depressing thing to think. We're 60 years on from Frank Drake. He's still, thank goodness, alive mm-hmm. and well in Northern California. His eponymous uh, Drake equation being kind of the for- foundation cornerstone of it. As Paul, as you point out in the book, it's really an expression of our ignorance and how little we know about it. I always say if my undergraduates turned in an equation that had no error bars associated with it, I'd, I'd flunk them. But um, but thinking about looking for nothing, you know, basically in all the right places, uh, it's got to do something to the field. And, and that's why I do, you, you spoke last night, Paul, very eloquently about the pop, uh, possibility of a shadow biosphere. Can you say a little bit more about that? We had a conversation um, on the occasion of Primo Levi's 100th birthday, what would have been his 100th birthday, uh, a couple months ago in 2019 on his famous book, The Periodic Table, uh, and also the, uh, which also had its 150th birthday last year. A lot of things had their, uh, the Dustbuster had its 40th anniversary last year, very important to those of us with kids. Uh, and I want to know, um, you know we, ha- we had a conversation with, with a, a a chemist here who studies this uh, difference in polymerization and handedness, chirality, biochirality. Mm-hmm. You mentioned something which you know is very uh, widely underappreciated. I would say. Can you say something about this this kind of thing that could be hiding in plain sight, perhaps in our own bodies or in our biosphere? Uh, yes, I think this is really important. I've uh, stressed already that the big unknown factor in the Drake equation is the probability that non-life will turn into life given a suitable planet. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what that is. But if we now take the optimistic view that most of my astrobiology colleagues uh, choose to take, which is that life will pop up all over the place given half a chance, then uh, it means that that transition from non-life to life is really very likely under Earth-like conditions. While no planet is more Earth-like than Earth itself, so shouldn't life have started many times over right here on our home planet? Uh, Well, how do we know it didn't? Has anybody trouble to look? And the answer is almost nobody has looked. Uh, And we could imagine that life may have started hundreds of times on Earth. Uh, Is it uh, possible that more than one form of life has survived to the present day. Now, it could be that life as we know it simply eliminated all the competition. Uh, but we know that even among life uh, as we know it, there are, for example, um, microbes called archaea. Um, they, we know microbes called bacteria, and they've coexisted peacefully for a very long period of time. So uh, might they be coexisting with another microbial form that is not just another branch on the known tree of life, but a separate tree altogether, a separate genesis. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, how might we tell? Mm. And so we've held uh, meetings at Arizona State University and the Beyond Center to uh, try and come up with a strategy. Where would you look? What would you look for? Uh, It's actually pretty hard. uh, And I can uh, give you one example where it would stand out. And this is, you mentioned chirality. Uh, Life as we know it is based on uh, left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. That is that uh, if you look at these molecules in a mirror, uh, they are certainly allowed by the laws of physics and chemistry, but we don't find normal life using them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we can imagine uh, mirror life where life gets going a second time and everything is around the other way. Uh, And these two life forms wouldn't Uh, be in competition, really, apart from resources. They wouldn't be eating each other because they'd be indigestible to each Mm -hmm. other. So we could uh, go look for mirror life. Mm -hmm. That's a long shot. Obviously, all these things are a long shot. But there's uh, a whole lot of other things we could look for. And one that is my favorite is that we know there's an upper limit of temperature Mm. for life that we know, uh, which is about 125 degrees Celsius. Uh, You find organisms living at those temperatures in deep ocean volcanic volcanic vents. Extremophiles. Yes, Mm -hmm. uh, we call them extremophiles. They particularly like these extreme conditions. Uh, But the temperatures coming out of these uh, vents go right up to 300 degrees, something Mm. like that. So if we found that there was nothing living from 125 to 150, and then we find organisms that are living 150 to 180 say, then we would zero in on those. Mm -hmm. The internal biochemistry would be different, it would be more heat resistant, uh, and that would stand out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Much harder would be if there is a, we call it a shadow biosphere, this uh, uh, hypothetical alien life that will be uh, all among us, if it was intermingled Mm -hmm. with ordinary life and liked the same conditions. And then separating the sheep from the goats, so to speak, would be very hard. You Mm -hmm. can't tell by looking under a microscope, uh, just little bugs, uh, and you 
you need to delve into the biochemical in it. And, micro uh, and, properties, and you need yeah. to know what to look for. Did you have a, a comment you want to make, Jim? I wanted to ask uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, how much w looking would one have to do in order to begin to falsify that proposition? Uh, well, it, um, uh, to falsify it, uh, that's a that's a difficult one, is it? To you say that to, 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 to say <laughs> that there are that we can be absolutely sure that a hundred percent of uh, terrestrial microbes are life as we know it. Uh, the truth is, only a tiny, tiny fraction mm -hmm. of terrestrial microbes can be cultured, uh, and only a fraction of those can be sequenced. Mm -hmm. So we just scratch the surface of this microbial realm. We don't know what all those little bugs are. Mm. Uh, they're in their countless uh, trillions. They're all around us. Uh, and then we have the viruses as well. We have got the whole uh, virusphere. Uh, and uh, and we really are nowhere near. But because the techniques of microbiology are customized to life that we know, it, it's not going to work with anything that won't cooperate. Mm. And if you go to a lab and there's uh, uh, some poor student trying to get their PhD um, working with some sort of extremophile organism and they have an organism that doesn't cooperate and there's floods of tears and, you know, how are you going to get your PhD? And what happens to these organisms that don't cooperate? Well, they go down the sink and they work with something else. Uh, and uh, that, that's the problem. Everything is customized mm. to life. So, you know, you go looking for A, you'll find A. You won't find B. Right. Confirmation mm. bias. Mm. I want to close in with a few more questions uh, for each one of you. So first, Matt, um, what if the falsification comes? I mean, what, to what extent would that impact society? I almost feel that there's an urge, an urge to feel that we're not alone and, and sort of hinted at in Paul's, in Paul's book, right? The eerie silence, that there's something uh, perplexing, paradoxical, and maybe unsettling uh, to the human psyche, that what if we are alone? What would the implications be if the hypothesis of alien life or even not technological, if we somehow knew that we're it? What would that mean for humanity? Seems like a pretty big burden for us to carry if we learn about that, because mm -hmm. then it says the universe is ours. Mm -hmm. And what do we decide to do with it? How do we bring the supposed benefits of whatever our species has achieved uh, uh, across at least our piece of the Milky Way? Um, I think you're right. I think that we do want to believe that we're not alone. Uh, and, and yes, I hadn't thought of the significance of the word eerie in your title, Paul, but you're right, it would feel strange. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be by all by themselves, or at least very few of us. Um, who was it that said that if we learn, whether we learn the galaxy is teeming with life or whether we learn we are by ourselves, either way, isn't that the most significant thing we may ever learn? Mm -hmm. And I think that was Arthur C. Clarke. Clark, yes. oh, Clark right. of course. Exactly. That's right. Oh, there's a, I, I imagine for, for a moment that Columbus had landed in a new world and found no one there. Mm -hmm. That would have been very eerie for them because every land they knew was occupied by humans. Right. And in fact, the new world was too. That's right. They watched him discover it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Jim, you've worked on the you know interface between and, and with your brother as well between hard science, physical science, science fiction, uh, science nonfiction. Uh, what what do you think impels or, or you know compels you so uh, vigorously to explore these really different or, or are they different? Maybe I shouldn't impose my own viewpoint on things, but you know, as a nonfiction writer, purely a nonfiction writer, I might spend six months on a single line or equation or result or data point in a paper, mm -hmm. whereas in a work of fiction, it's you have far more liberty. What are the aspects of these two different genres that appeal to you? Are there commonalities? And 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 lastly, can you? Can you teach someone to be creative in this way that, that the human imagination is so well adapted to, but in such disparate ways, the technical, the fictional, mm -hmm. etc.? Is that a, a skill that can be taught? The fundamental thing that's necessary uh, to be successful in those realms uh, is one common trait, curiosity. Mm -hmm. You've got to be curious about the world, and, and what you're curious about may not be as important, not nearly as important as the fact that you are curious, mm -hmm. because if you're truly curious, you'll keep being curious about more and more things. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes life lively for people like us, right? right. Someone said, you know, Einstein said that curiosity 
is more important than knowledge. But you know, I know I want my my uh, my heart mm-hmm. surgeon to be more knowledgeable than curious. You know, what is this red beating thing in my chest? <laughs> but it's not easy to make people curious. Right. There are we know lots right. of people who are not curious. Mm-hmm. And 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 if we, and a lot of people, if we found that we were alone, mm-hmm. would just say, well, "Let's stay home. <laughs> it's comfortable here." That's right. I didn't catch Besides, a fish. It's too expensive <laughs> to go out there. So yeah, right. yeah. I didn't uh, ca- yeah, you know, I can watch it on TV. I didn't catch a fish <laughs> when I took the glass of water down to the Black Speech. Right. Uh, and Paul, maybe we'll close with you. Um, You've written uh, 31 books. Last time I counted. Yeah, I understand. Right at the second, you're writing another book, which is really impressive. Um, you know, as we're recording this podcast, you're on number 32. Uh, to, to, you know, what, what is your process like? I've always been perplexed because you, you are so phenomenally um, creative, but you have this throughput that spans and, and, and goes literally from the biological to the astrophysical, from the microphysical to the cosmological. Um, is this something that you can teach? I mean, you're a professor, your day job, uh, you know, your day-to-day job is being a professor. Can you teach this to young people? And and what do you think of the future uh, of all these different fields that you're working in? Well, it's interesting you should ask about teaching because uh, the I, I've just been co-teaching with my wife, who's uh, a, a former BBC radio science journalist, uh, co-teaching a course on science communication. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, it. I, I, when I was a youngster, I had no idea whether I, I never thought about writing. In fact, I barely scraped through English at mm. high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the first piece of science exposition I had to do was my PhD thesis. <laughs> uh, and it was only after that that I thought, well, actually, uh, I quite like explaining all this stuff. And I could probably, uh, as we would say these days, dumb it down mm-hmm. a lot. And it started off from there. Uh, but uh, nobody ever taught me how to do it. Yeah. And what I found, and it's interesting that the uh, entire students uh, were female. Mm. Uh, uh, and among these, these young women, uh, a couple of them really had what it takes. Uh, mm. They were writing uh, sample essays that could have been published right away. Mm. And some of them were totally hopeless. And mm. so uh, I don't think anything we taught them, apart from a few obvious things, uh, mm. you know, try to come to a conclusion and don't exceed the number of words mm. and so on, I don't think uh, it really helps very much. I think you've either got it or you haven't. Right. Mm. Uh, and I write about things I'm thinking about anyway. I'm very fortunate that the Beyond Center has enormous scope, uh, and in my life, I, I, I regard myself as really a theoretical physicist, and mm-hmm. I, that's the only real research, as far as I'm concerned. That's but I've worked identity. in astrobiology and cancer research and uh, philosophy of, of science and mm-hmm. so on. So I'm thinking uh, about these things anyway. So for mm-hmm. me to write a book, if you said to, uh, to me, could I write a book on black holes? I could probably do it in a, in a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you give me something more challenging, like, uh, I don't know, condensed matter physics mm-hmm. or something I know less about, it would take much longer. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I tend to write what I'm write about what I'm thinking about. It doesn't take that long. And not the actual writing part. As Blaise Pascal said, if I had more time, I could have made it shorter. <laughs> uh, I do want to ask you, since I don't have these opportunities very often, if there's a hyper intelligent uh, species of alien somewhere, or God, or something like that, uh, what question, one question, would you most like to know the answer to uh, <laughs> during your lifetime? Um, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about whether the fundamental laws of physics, which is, uh, you know, this is the sort of d- d- daily bread of uh, physicists, you, the, in the textbooks you use them, uh, where, where do they come from? Could they have been otherwise? Mm-hmm. Einstein said that the thing that really interested him was whether uh, I think the good Lord choice, had a choice, right? you mm-hmm. know. And uh, what he meant by that, you don't have to be religious, but could the world be otherwise and still have inquiring beings like ourselves uh, within it? Within it. Uh, and that's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about throughout my career. I sort of got it from Fred Hoyle, actually, right. uh, that he was sort thinking about those things even in the 50s. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. It's very profound because it transcends actual science. Yeah. It's about why is the universe comprehensible and why uh, can human beings actually understand it? And, right. and could could that world 
been otherwise. Otherwise, fascinating. Oh, very good. Okay. Well, that satisfies one of my questions. That, w- that would be the one question I would ask. What would Paul Davies really? ask the old one? Uh, Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, James Benford, Microwave Sciences, and Paul Davies, Beyond Center, Arizona State University. Thank you all so much. I want to encourage everybody online to subscribe to our YouTube channels uh, and to our podcast on Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast. Please leave a review and a rating. It really helps us uh, very much to attract and grow the audience. Uh, thank you so much, Brian Keating, from the campus of UC San Diego at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.